Let's begin. <laughs> hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. It's safe to assume most have heroes in their lives, but not all wear a costume. Well, speak of the devil. Hello, Mrs. 420. Doughboy's newest story is just about to premiere. I know, I heard, and I've been dying to hear this one. Well, they say one's first heroes are their parents. So, why don't you introduce tonight's story? Well, I'd be happy to. I'd like to thank you all for stopping tonight for a tight touting tale, sure to put the hero in horrendous. My son Doughboy420 calls this one, Not All Heroes Wear Capes. The guilt... Of the guilty. It's been a year since I saved the city from a madman in the guise of a friendly philanthropist. Lehman Brown had been the ultimate culprit behind a string of murders and robberies. Under the alias of the Handyman, Mr. Brown was able to bring together a group of people like me people with abilities that no human could or should ever have. There were some pretty wild people that I went up against, with the help of my friend Eidolon, who I met along the way, and together we were able to put a stop to the handyman's crimes and remove his prosthetic hand along with the source of his power, and, well, all of our powers really, his ring, the seal of Solomon. Turns out, it was demons inside of us giving us these inhuman and inhumane abilities. Mine caused others to end their own lives at the command of my touch, a power I used to bring justice the best I could. But I wasn't a good guy. I made people commit suicide, not a thing that good guys do. It was also not a good thing when I finally put a stop to the handyman. I didn't use my power on him. It wasn't the demon inside of me that strangled the life out of him. It was me. I did it with my own two hands. He kidnapped my daughter and put her in harm's way. He threatened her life. So I put a painful end to his. I got my revenge, and rightfully so, but I'm sure it'll still cost me a bit of what was left of my soul. He was a terrible person, and he deserved to die. He had to die, but it still weighs on me. The memory of watching the life slip from his eyes, the feeling of his pulse beating rapidly in his neck as my fingers gripped it tightly. The feeling of it slowing and ultimately coming to a halt as his skin turned blue. I really was a murderer, but since then I have kept myself in check. I always wear gloves and I always wear long sleeves to hide the darkness of my hand, my god hand, or to be more accurate now, my demon hand. Even when my little girl and I went on vacation to Hawaii, courtesy of the late Mr. Brown, I still didn't take off my long sleeves or gloves. I couldn't risk anyone seeing my darkened hand, or worse yet, I couldn't risk anyone accidentally bumping into it and drowning themselves in the Pacific, or throwing themselves into the Kalua volcano. So I was very aware of my surroundings, both there and after when we returned home to the city. Everything quieted down for a while. I used my powers sparingly because I didn't want to, nor 
did I really need to use them in most instances. After Lehman Brown was dead and buried, things mostly returned to normal, and the crime rate actually dropped quite a bit. I guess word of fuck around and find out had spread through the city enough to make people think twice. So, Eidolon and I mostly traded in our superhero get-ups for a spatula and an apron that read, An apron is just a backwards cape, which we thought was absolutely appropriate. Eidolon would frequently stop by and visit my daughter and I, and it was on one occasion, when we were out back having a cookout on the grill, that our comfy life changed drastically once more. I was flipping burgers on our deck out back when our fun times of laughter were interrupted by a cacophony of screams. Eidolon took my daughter inside to keep her safe while I unlocked and opened the gate to the alley between the houses out back where we put our garbage to be picked up. We still didn't live in the best neighborhood, but until then, the worst we had to worry about were a few drug dealers slinging their product in that back alley. But now, there was screaming emanating from back there. I went back there to find a few people running away, while a bunch of my neighbors were gathered together around something, pointing and speaking amongst themselves. Hey, what's going on? I asked the group of people. Oh man, my neighbor Steve said. It was crazy. We heard screaming and turned the corner to find this guy just turned into gold. I mean, actual, real gold. It was the craziest thing I'd ever saw, he said, kind of in shock and awe of what he had witnessed. I didn't know if I quite believed him or if I thought he was exaggerating, but I had to push through the crowd to see for myself, and sure enough, there it was. A man frozen in a permanent pose of terror, his body turned to gold. One of the guys that lived down the road reached out to touch the cheek of the golden man. He pushed at the soft, golden flesh and found that the poor man was not a solid chunk of gold when a small piece of his cheek fell off beneath the man's invasive fingers, revealing bloody flesh beneath. The crowd gasped in shock before the police arrived to cordon the scene. What's going on? asked Eidolon as I re-entered the yard. After looking around to be sure my little girl wasn't around to hear, I told Eidolon what I had seen. Do you think there's more of them? Eidolon asked me in a concerned tone, referring to others like us. I don't know, but after seeing a guy's skin go 24 carat, I would say, yeah, it's probably pretty likely. I answered her with a bit of a joke. I'm gonna suit up tonight, you in? Eidolon asked, a bit excited by the aspect of some real action. I don't know, it's been a few months and... Well, I'm not really up for it, I said, still haunted by my past actions. Come on! Eidolon urged me. I'm gonna go whether you do or not, but I sure could use your help. Please? She begged with an almost sing-song tone. All right, fine. I begrudgingly agreed. Yay! She cheered. I'll meet you at the usual spot, let's say, nine tonight? Deal. I replied with a sigh. Awesome, I'll go get ready. She said, turning to head back home. But... It's only around noon, I said, confused by the need for such a long period of time to get ready. You've said it yourself. It's been months since we've done this. I've been slacking, and so have you, she said, poking my belly. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I'll see you tonight, I said, jokingly swatting her hand away from my beer gut. See you tonight she said before happily running off, leaving me to find a way to explain a crazy situation to my daughter and come up with a reason to drop her off with her grandparents for the weekend. I tried to make up some story about having to help some friends with their work, but my little girl saw right through it almost immediately 
and she looked me in the eyes just as bluntly and said, You helped me when I needed you, and you can help other people when they need you too. I understand, she said with a smile. It warmed my heart quite a bit to hear that. I'm afraid that I don't really help people. I just, well, I stop bad people. I tried to explain, using the best words I could to make myself not sound like the monster that I was. I stop bad people in any way I can, and I'm just afraid that for every person I help, I end up hurting more. I told her, with a feeling of sadness replacing the warming emotion. You still stop the bad people and help the good people. You're my hero, she said with another cute smile. I still didn't quite entirely believe her words, but it did feel like a giant load off my shoulders to hear them. Thank you, Hunbun. I thanked her with a tight hug before sending her off to pack her clothes and toys so that we could take her to her grandparents' house. Night quickly came, and I pulled my suit out of its hiding place in my closet. I admired the leather and the god hand patch over the left breast, the symbol of a blackened fist leaking into a golden halo, which then looped back around to be gripped by the black fist once again, like the symbol of the Ouroboros, a serpent or some other creature circling around and consuming its own tail. I looked at the gold halo and thought of my gilded neighbor. What were we getting ourselves into? I then donned my suit and noticed a problem. My stomach poked out just a bit from beneath my armored leather hoodie. God damn it, she was right. I sighed before removing the hoodie to throw on a black t-shirt before once again donning the armored hoodie with gray inner lining and lifting up the bandana with my red symbol of a blood-stained cross. I was out of shape, but I was about to restart my workout regimen. I met Eidolon that night on the roof of Layman's Terms Building, which had now rebranded themselves and changed their name to Philanthropy Entrepreneur Planning, or PEP for short. They specialized in helping other companies start up and strengthen their own brands, but specifically, they sought to help companies that in turn would help others live better lives. It was one of the tallest buildings in the city, and it was great for allowing Eidolon to use her abilities to search the city for a lead, or for trouble. But that wasn't the only reason that we chose to meet up here. The ring wasn't the only important thing about the handyman prosthetic arm. There was also a hidden compartment inside a hidden stash box that held a key. It took a little while of searching, but eventually Eidolon's shadows found a hidden keyhole beneath a railing on the roof, and when we inserted the key, it opened up a hidden room on the roof of the building, a room that was not in the blueprints of the building, and surely a room that only Mr. Layman Brown knew about. It was filled with computers and hard drives. The only problem was, all of it was encrypted, and neither of us were computer hackers. So, for the time being, that was useless to us. But other than that, it worked great as a safe home base. We were the only ones on the planet that knew about it. It wasn't too long before Eidolon was alerted by her shadow sight. She could not only control the shadows, but if she concentrated hard enough, she could see through them, but only in shades of gray. I think I found something, she said, her eyes closed and her forehead wrinkled. Is it another golden guy? I asked. Either that or we have a human statue mime, she joked, opening her eyes. Down at the park near Front Street. She added before blinking away into the night, once again leaving me on the roof. There she goes again, I said to myself 
before turning to go back inside our secret base, because not only did it have a stash of the handyman's secrets, but it also held an express elevator to the garage, which gave me easy access to the motorcycle that I had picked up with Lehman Brown's money. I met Eidolon once again in the park, near Front Street, and sure enough, there was a golden girl. And I'm not talking about the sitcom. There was a woman, probably in her forties, frozen in place, a look of terror upon her face as she attempted to shield herself from some attacker that no longer appeared to be present. Then behind her we spotted another person, and then another, and another. There were over a half dozen people, all frozen in different positions of fearing and fleeing. One unfortunate soul had been frozen as he ran away, toppling over on one foot to smash his face onto the ground. His face was now a pile of broken chips of gold, along with a bloody mess of smashed-in flesh, laying in an ever-growing pool of crimson. There still wasn't a large puddle. Whoever did this couldn't have been too far off. I quickly dodged a projectile from the shadows, leaning backwards as a large chunk of gold flew from the shadows and smashed onto the floor. Upon quick inspection, I was able to make out that it was an arm broken off of a human statue at the elbow. This was followed by a decapitated golden head broken off from a statue and thrown in my direction. This one nearly hit me, but I was able to once again dodge out of the way, where the head broke and splattered against a tree. Stop right where you are, a man's voice commanded from to my right. I turned just enough to find a guy with his arm wrapped around a crying woman. The man was a small, frail thing. He had that affluent, princely look to him. Well kept, but small and weak due to a life of having everything handed to him. He had curly, shoulder-length hair and bright, piercing blue eyes. His petite lips parted to reveal perfectly white, shiny teeth. He wore a sky-blue colored suit, and everything about him appeared completely normal, aside from his right arm, which, from the elbow down, was about three times as large as his other arm, and appeared be made of solid gold. He held it low to his side, letting it dangle while not in use, most likely due to the weight of the precious metal. He looked very much like me, one of us with an arm of solid gold and the other with an arm of rot and decay. Don't make a move, either of you, the man said with a bit of what sounded like an English accent. Lest this woman become my own golden statue of freedom, he said with a shining smile. What do you want, Goldilocks? Eidolon asked the man. That's very clever. The man with the gilt touch spoke. How about Gold Digger? You like that better? She quipped once again. Oh, feisty. I quite like this one. The man with the golden hair and matching hand spoke heard the question, what do you want? I spoke up. I'm here to kill you, both of you. It's what the master wants, so you have a choice. Either she dies, or you two die. I don't care how you do it. End yourselves or each other. Or I could do it. Whatever you wish. But do decide quickly, because I'm very short on time and patience. Gold Digger gave the ultimatum. Why are you... I began, but was interrupted by him. I just have to kill you. That's what he wants. Now have you decided, or should I start counting like your disobedient children? The man spouted out. Fine. I'll go first. I spoke with a defeated tone as I approached the man with my hands in the air and my glove still on. What are you doing? Asked Eidolon in shock. I just shot her a look and then turned back to my target. As I neared the man, 
and his hostage. I decided to act. I ripped the glove from my hand and lunged toward them. In one motion, the gold digger brushed his arm past the woman, touching her and grabbing me in the process, as my death hand gripped down onto his left wrist. No! He screamed as he backed up. The woman also screamed as her skin began to bubble and solidify, turning from a flesh color to a silvery, scaly surface before finally shifting once again into a shimmering gold as the skin transformed. Eidolon reacted quickly and used her shadows to rip through the woman's arm, cutting off the spread of the gilding of her flesh, before blinking her away as quickly as possible to the nearest hospital in hopes of saving her life. In all the screams and chaos of what unfolded, I lost sight of the gold digger, and when I returned my gaze to where he once stood, all I saw was an arm partly turned gold. The flesh ripped away around the elbow, laying in a pool of blood and gold dust upon the stone walkway. The man had turned his ability on himself and used it in order to save himself, like an animal stuck in a trap, gnawing off its own leg. I feared this wouldn't be the last we saw of the gold digger, and now I had a lot more questions to be answered. Well, if you're feeling bad about killing the wicked, suck it up, Buttercup, and just keep going. I mean, eventually, you may just become one of them anyway. But if you heroes want to keep painting that town red, make sure to stop back here again next weekend. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>